Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for our morning study and we thank you for the beautiful lessons that we're gaining from the Acts of the Apostles, which we know are what we're going to be doing and what we ought to be doing, Lord. We ask that you help those lessons be impressed upon our minds and please help us to also have a mind ready and able and capable to understand and retain the information we're about to learn next. Lord, um, we're going through these revolution studies that Sister Elaine is presenting and and they're putting into place our history and what it all means. And it's very important that we understand these things. This keeps coming back and we know there's another type of revolution that we're about to experience. Lord, please help us to understand these things. Help us to continue in our studies and Lord, um, give us all better ability to, to have time to study. I know there's many people struggling with time and difficulties with work. Lord, we need your help in this matter. I ask that you please help us and bless us with a way to figure out how to arrange things so that things can be easier and less burdensome on those who, all of us really, who need more study time to be able to draw closer to you. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you for the Sabbath day, and we pray all this in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I just did read a quick comment from Sister Kathy Brown on there about um, all the focus that's on the external and 
I admit that that's a challenge for me too, because we need to have the external, but we cannot neglect the internal in our own study, in our own, um, in our own drawing closer, closer to the Lord and uh, gaining that experience in, in perfecting our characters. So this is uh, number 45 out of 46. So we are just about done with this. And this one's a long one, so <clears throat> I'm not sure if we'll make it all the way through or not, but we'll see how far we get. Um, but it is kind of a long one to go through. And it's a very full study. The, you'll see the slides are actually pretty full. It's hard to get the, the lines all on one page without re-shrinking everything. <clears throat> So we're going to take a minute and review the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia because it is a recurring theme. So if everybody remembers that from Acts 27, where the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia um, fit in, we identify the midnight cry or panium, and this is the defeat of the king of the south here and the deadly wound. We know that at Raphia, we knew that it was the king of the south that wins, but at Panium, the king of the south is going to receive a deadly wound, leading up to the death. Then we identify that, and when with this death, we know this death is at, at Sunday Law, this death paves the way then for the United States to be the superpower of the world, lone superpower of the world. So then we identify this waymark as Sunday Law, but if we want to call this the Midnight Cry, and then what does Sunday Law become? Sunday Law is the close of probation. So you've got the Midnight Cry or Panium, which is Sunday Law, or the close of probation, which means we have a shut door. From the Midnight Cry to the shut door, we have, been, we have the fall of the United States and also of Adventism. We have the rise of the UN and a new type of leadership in the Adventist church. We come to this way, Mark. We mark the end of the sixth head in the beginning of, in the beginning of the seventh. This is the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia. So this period of time here is in Acts 27, the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia. If this is a close of probation, and we bring this history into our history, so this is Panium, the actual Panium, and Sunday law, if we bring that into our history, the line of the priests, what are the way marks? Panium becomes 2018, and the close of probation becomes Raphia. From 2018 to Raphia, what do we expect to see externally? So, and this is what we've just come through in this, and keep in mind as we read this, go through this presentation, this was done in, uh, the date on this one particular presentation was April 3rd. So this is prior to, obviously, November 9th that we're looking at. So to, the start, to start with the external, we said in our last class regarding the United States that it's marking stages in its life cycle. We can say 2016 there's a dictator that's raised up and the Republican horn is broken. We can say the same thing at Raffia. We can say the same thing at Panium, and we can say the same thing at Sunday Law. The reason we said that, because when we go to these histories, we see the death and the rising of a dictator. So on this side of the line, on when you're looking at here, this side of the line, we have Abraham Lincoln, and on the other side of the line, we have Napoleon. On one side, we have Kaiser Wilhelm on the other side, Lenin. So you can mark the death and the rise of a dictator, but it's the same person, just like where we have the United States on this side, then the United States on this side. We have Donald Trump this side and Donald Trump this side. But what she's doing is taking, since this is a close of probation, then you can also mark our close of probation here and take this structure to what we're seeing internally. Does that make sense? I... We've seen this transition internally as well. I, I think I might ask you the question about this um, last weekend because we were studying this stuff last weekend. Um, I'm still confused about it. Why Lincoln is marked as the sixth and Napoleon is marked as the seventh. Like it's the opposite order that they even existed in. 
and I'm just confused by that. Abraham Lincoln, and, and it takes lining up the various lines. We saw Abraham Lincoln dies in 1865, right? Yeah. What did 1865 line up with? End of the Civil War. No, no, I mean, uh, I oh. probably asked the question wrong. Um, uh, on the lines, you mean? On the, uh, yeah, and I think it was the 151 that takes you to, to, to there. Um, if somebody does the math, I don't want to say it wrong. It takes you to 2019. So when you have, and I don't have that in front of me to put it up, but when you have, if you take the Civil War, and, there, and it's coming up on another slide, so maybe I can demonstrate it as we go forward. But when you take the Civil War, you had 1861, 1863, 1865. We know 1863 is the midpoint. When you take 1865, that's the end point, like the bookend date. So when you go into our history and you see 2014 is the midpoint, the bookend dates for our history of Civil War is beginning 2001, 9-11, and ending at 2019. Yeah. So you take that 2019 that lines up as a, as a bookend, an end point, and that's where 1865 lines up to where you have the death of Abraham Lincoln. So you mark the death of Abraham Lincoln at 2019 based on the Civil War in 1865 being the end point of the Civil War. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. So the confusing part for me is then why Napoleon on the other side of the line? Because no, Napoleon lines up in a different, on a, using a different line because we're lose, using multiple lines and different methods of getting there. Napoleon lines up with the end of the French Revolution, but he actually falls on the date, November 9, 1799. So you have in 1865, if you look at Raffia as 2019 as an end point, right? Yeah. You have Abraham Lincoln dies at that end point, but you also have at that same end point in the French Revolution, Napoleon rising. Yeah, that all makes really good sense. I still struggle and you, maybe you won't be able to answer. Maybe I'm just struggling with it because we're taking two separate individuals and I've just never seen it before in any other application where it's like we're bringing these two together and almost like juxtaposing them and they're from opposite time period. Like the whole thing just seems really strange to me and it all makes sense the way that you're explaining it. I'm still just not. The the, the 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 slides going forward are going to have it all on visual and yeah, we'll try to touch page. on it next okay. page. and right, we'll, we'll try to cover it a little bit more as we go through there because you have the same thing going on with Kaiser Wilhelm and Lenin yeah. um, okay. having to do with what line you're looking at to bring them to this to this point right here okay so um, yeah so but the next slides hopefully will help but I tell you what I think I made this comment to you in a mess in a mess in messenger once or maybe it was when we talked, I can't remember, but because when we struggle with these things, I'll tell you where we're going to really struggle in this particular presentation is where she lines up the second half of the Civil War. And uh, I'll, you'll see that when we get there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, think we, I think we watched that. We, we did watch the fourth one, and I, well, I'll see what you're talking about when we get there, but this was the thing that the three of us last weekend were kind of looking at, and we're like, a little bit confused about all the logic made sense around it and you explained it better than I even remember understanding it last weekend. Well but, praise the Lord that means I might be understanding some things myself. I think you are. <laughs> but uh because it definitely comes from all the different lines and I have a couple of the slides are going to have all the all a couple of the slides I couldn't fit it all in to get verbiage in there too but there's a couple of the slides that I put all of the lines together that show it so Okay, so you can mark the death, let's see, um, you can mark the death and the rise of a dictator, but it's the same person. And you can see the sixth and the seventh head is the same country, the United States. And then the United States now wielding power over the UN. So that's what you're going to have when you get here. This is, this is if it were, you know, at the Sunday Law, we are looking at it in, in, on our line, on the priest line. But on the line of the Sunday law here, it's the death of the sixth head and the rise of the seventh head. It's the U.S. here, but it's the U.S. here wielding their power over the U.N. There's also this element of a change in leadership. We can see Adventism in this history. Once it comes to the history of the midnight cry in the ship, you hear the voice of Paul. And Ellen White says, whether it looks like it or not, he's the master of that ship. So in this history... Paul 
is the master of that ship. So we're seeing this external and internal. There's a change in leadership and stages of its life cycle. We look at the external and we see Donald Trump. He's already been a leader, but he starts to transform and he becomes the leader after Sunday Law that he wasn't back in the prior history. He has a, he has a new type of authority. So he becomes a dictator over the UN. This is the fall of their institutions. So the United States is falling as a lamb-like beast or republicanism. What we're doing is marking progression. It can represent different people. We can see Obama turn to Trump. So there's times when it represents different people, but one person can represent two people. So we bring this into the internal 2018 to Rafia, because this is the external here. We're looking at going to Sunday Law. We're going to bring it to us here to 2018 to Rafia. What are we supposed to see? Elder Jeff, if you were to look at this as the priest line, and this being 2018, Elder Jeff announced his resignation, whatever that means. And keep in mind that this was back in April. He had just announced his resignation. Sorry, so we're looking at the internal. We're looking at the line of the priest. Right, on the internal, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So Elder Jeff announced his resignation in between 2018 and Rafia, right? He just did that back in uh, May of 2019. He announced his resignation. But he's passing the mantle. We're seeing this transition between our midnight cry and our close of probation. And for anybody that saw on the WhatsApp group, the brief snippet that somebody posted from Wales where uh was it in Wales was that I think Wales? it was FFA it was FFA yeah it was prior because that was 2017 I believe it was when they anointed I think it was I'm pretty sure it was when they anointed Parminder but he says specifically that there was a vote and Parminder was voted leader Wait, he was, whoa, whoa, whoa. He was anointed in 2017 of the prime minister? Or 16, 2016 or 17. Isn't, is that when all the elders were um, anointed, like Tabo, Marco? Yeah, when you had the three of them. But I think also, I'm, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but when Jeff made that comment that they voted him leader, I think that what they voted him leader at that time on and I, don't, I didn't read the, the WhatsApp comments on it, but I'm pretty sure that what he anointed him leader was over outside the U.S. Yeah, I think that's what it was too when I was watching it, because I was wondering about that, because he wasn't, Jeff was still kind of in his position, whatever right. it was. But, and I'm, I guess like that's when they kind of split the leadership between the whole overall movement and then FFA and School of the Prophets. That seemed like that vote was that Parminder was going to then be what seemed to be Jeff's active position at the time, but it was strange because when I was watching that video, I was thinking, well, if that happened then, which was two years ago, what was the passing of the mantle then? When he officially responded, um, then he would take over the U.S. as well, the whole thing. So this did happen two oh. years ago, 2017. He was anointed. Well, I thought it was a long time. I thought... Can uh, I, I say something? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you guys' conversation. I was at the anointing. That was in 2016 when 2016. we were down there as students at FFA. And, and it, was, it was this Marco, Tabo, and Parminder got anointed so they can, um, they have their establishments all over the world. Tabo was for Africa, Marco was for South America and that area. And then Parminder had all of Europe. And it was between the three of them. And the idea of the baptism was so they, when they go to their respective parts of the world to host Bible meetings and studies and school of the prophets and so forth, that they can do marriages and funeral services, bap well, baptisms, I guess that was part of it too, um, in the respectful places, they're able to do that. But between the three of them, um, Elder Tabo, Elder Marco, and Elder Parminder came together and they prayerfully, and this is what Parminder told me, they prayer, prayerfully voted that Parminder would be the overseer out of all three of them to have the, the bigger role at that time. 
And yeah. um, so anyways, that's, that's where it is now. And you're right, when Jeff in 2018 said that he must decrease and Perminder must increase, that's a whole different ball game because that's where he's panting, passing a mantle on to another man who's supposed to take over the whole movement. And then when you got your Germany camp meeting, there's a misunderstanding in the audience by one of the FFA members. Right. Right. That's, that's so, my that's understanding. That's what I was thinking, 2016, not 2017. Thank you. Um, so, so way back in 2016, it was already determined that Parminder would be the leader over I, I, Europe. everything but the U.S. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they would all yeah. work together. But I do thank you for reminding me of the point because it had to do with people wanting baptism, people wanting to get married, and there was and Jeff couldn't do all of that. So they had to put somebody in charge beyond the USA. So Jeff was essentially And now go oh, ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Allie. No, no. No, I, I, all I was gonna say the is Canadian that... standoff. We finally got to see uh... one. <laughs> 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 oh, I thought we were going to be it's here all day. Right. That's a really sick story. Uh, Ali, did you get it? You said it was a Canadian standoff. It's where you know that you get it, right? <laughs> yeah, like, I get it. Two Canadians in the door oh. telling each other to go first. <laughs> okay, oh, go I know. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, I just want to, now I forget what I was going to say. Shoot. Oh, um, elders. <laughs> At the Germany, the two European, uh, I think Germany last year and Germany this year, or was it Italy last year, Germany this year? I don't know. But anyways, the inter, the 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 um, those two big camp meetings where all the countries meet together, they're baptizing or not baptizing, but ordaining elders. So now elders in respectful areas like Manjit Bayant, for example, first he was ordained as a Bible worker, but then when Jeff asked him and his wife and children to go to Africa to do work there in areas that Tabo is not overseeing, that they would take over the ministry in Africa and they agreed to do that. Then this year in Germany, Elder Mangent was, was ordained as an elder. So now he has the work that Tabo is doing also in Africa where he can do baptisms and so forth. And that kind of thing. So now more elders have been ordained in their respectable countries that they can carry on the work and it's expanding the, the three original ones, you know, but you know that. With that question real quick, sorry, I know Brother Jonathan want to say something. So Elder Parminder, he's over Canada, right? Tabo's over I'm Canada. sorry, that's what I meant, Tabo. That, but so he's not doing the work in Africa, he's working with Canada, right? Both, I think. And oh, both. in Africa, he's got both. But Africa is a gigantic country, east yeah. to west, right? On right. continent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm with you, Ali. No, what does Brother Jonathan have? I know Jonathan wants to say something. Um, so, Elder Sh, I always no, don't know how to say her name. Shaqueta. Shaqueta. Okay. Um, she, she, in Germany, she replaced Jeff, right? Like that's essentially what happened. Jeff was already stepped down, but she was ultimately replacing him as elder of the United States. Yeah. That's, I mean, I just, I think I was thinking of that earlier this morning. I, I don't I know. Never, just, I never thought about it as replacing that, him, but yes, over the U.S. Because it, she was also the first other than Tess um, female elder. So this had all kinds of things probably going on in Jeff's mind, you know, like not only is things are going awry according to him, but he's now essentially being replaced by one of the first female elders, which he doesn't agree with. But I, I don't know, I'm just sorry. I'm just kind of catching up with it all right now. I'm just thinking in my head, like that had to be an interesting situation, more, more to it than I thought. <laughs> well, the comments I saw, it was not just that the negative comments that I saw from their side was not only that she was a woman, it's because she was black. Black as well. Be careful about that, that, con that context of what he was saying wasn't to say that it was he hates black people. It was to say that he was had a prerogative. He was accusing Parminder of having a prerogative, an agenda. It wasn't necessary. Yeah, no, he did, you know it was an outward like aspect of racism, and I think Manjit had pointed that out in one of the chats. Mm -hmm. But I was, I kind of mentioned as well that racism isn't always like out on the outside, external like that. It's manifested through things that we say that may not be like 
you know, I hate such and such because they're this color or whatever. It's coming out in the way that you understand and believe. It's the same as sexism, right? So if he felt that it wasn't his prerogative for her to be an elder because she was a woman, then he is, essentially, he is obviously a sexist. But it's kind of the same thing. I mean, he wasn't saying she wasn't qualified because she was black. But there must have been some underlying things there because that whole letter that you wrote when you read it, Pardon yeah, me. there were some things on there that I read that it was because she was inexperienced, had no experience whatsoever. He could, yeah, he called her stupid or something like that. I mean, I'll have to go back and read the letter, but he, he was making some outward derogatory yeah. remarks, not, not in regards yeah. to her race, but just that she was completely unqualified because she was too, too dumb to think outside of her own perspective or something, like something strange like that that he said. Yeah. And I just thought like, wow, I mean, I, he obviously has some, something a little bit deeper that is going on there. Like, yeah. I, Anyway. Is that going to work? Because if that, John, do you remember that thing that, was it you who, someone posted something with him? No, yeah, that thing that you said with them telling their stories and part of one of the stories they were saying was trash talking um, Elder Shaquetta and her husband and the history that they had with them and something. And I'm like, what is going on over there? This is not godly character at all. Like you're just every personal encounter you ever had with the person first of all you're you're bringing it on which isn't your business to do and then second of all you're putting it in a light that no one has yeah. any way to verify yeah. so what, right. is, what are you doing what was that show? no christian benefit there at all no absolutely none no he sent me because he john was doing research for a presentation he was doing for the thursday night group and he stumbled upon what the ffa thing they just um, I was talking to Elder Shaquetta about this at Rescue. They opened the floor and like Larry was giving his testimony oh, about how, yeah, yeah, yeah. how horrible we are. And then yeah. everyone else jumped in and said, we always knew there was something about these people. Yeah. And it was like a good group discussion of how crazy and horrible we all are. But what is that? Where did you get all that from? It was that first, I think it was the first video that he put out. Or wasn't that correct? No, it was, it was Larry Hine put a video out um, right around, when was that? That was probably a few weeks ago or about a month ago now. Um, near the, about midway through the video, they had a question or like more like a- Testimony. A testimonial thing where they all were coming out and saying how they knew something was, was up and this and that was wrong. And they didn't understand the little girl with all the hit stories about history. And it, it just really was, a strange thing that they had this testimonial kind of like a mm. therapeutic session where they were all coming out with their thing and agreeing with each other. <laughs> it was therapy it was, for them, yeah, it seemed, yeah. for sure. So, so we got Elder Jeff who announces his um, retirement, but he's passing the mantle. We're seeing this transition between our midnight cry and our close of probation. So while you have this transition going on in the U.S. here, we see this transition internally here between our midnight cry and our close probation. Um, the move, it's the movement all the way through before and after, which is interesting because we're being called a new movement here and we're not a new movement. It's the same movement that goes all the way through. But there's a transition in leadership. Whether we mark it between midnight cry and close probation or Panium and Sunday Law, we see this change. We can take this model and take it to 2018 and it's something that's progressive. It doesn't all happen at once, but you see a change. Externally in the United States, we can already see Trump's language since December of 2018, it's changed. For those two years, he had advisors who had restrained him. So we know in the first two years of his presidency, he had the, the advisors, but then on December 19th, or was it 19th of 2018, when Mattis retired, um, left, resigned, um, and that was the last general there that would have had any kind of restraint on him. And he seems to be, be getting more and more surrounded by people in his administration that support him. I think it's really hard for us to really gauge how horrible he is because we're so desensitized yeah. to his stupidity. Like we're so numb. I don't think we realize how bad this is. It's really bad. I think this is Hitler. This probably already has yeah. been completely been oh, looking yeah. like Hitler. And we're just like in a la-la land. According to his first wife, the man slept with Mein Kampf on a bed stand. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it, was, it was his speeches. It was Hitler's speeches, not Mein Kampf. Um, which I don't know if there's that yeah. much of a difference. But uh, you can see that he's used the same method as Hitler um, as far as speech methodology. 
um, that Trump was using when you, because I think they're writing some, whoever wrote the article about him sleeping with those next to the bed, they were talking about that. And when we're looking at Trump as a dictator, I think that one mistake that people, especially people that are outside looking in and we're saying November 9th, he's going to be a dictator and all this stuff. Everyone has this idea in their head that they're thinking of Hitler standing in front of tens of thousands of soldiers giving, you know, Heil Hitler kind of thing in some crazy speech. But that's Hitler oh. already as a dictator. Like that's well down the road of him being a dictator. He was a dictator long, 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 long before that. And it was the rising up. And that's what we're looking at right now with Trump. Mm -hmm. is the, the actual dictatorship happens long before he's directing armies and all the stuff like that. It's he is a dictator in personality and in character and what he's trying to do with the acts that he's doing. He's the executive leader of the United States. He has every, he's the leader of the country and his style is dictatorship. So it's, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, like I see it that he actually, he actually already is a dictator. Like there's no. Yeah, yeah. And that's what this is all saying that he is a dictator before. He's just a dictator less restrained after. One thing that's that right. just popped in my mind is where you try to plot together, and he's always hanging around with dictators. Oh yeah, you know, like he's best friends. Look at the turkey with, guy there. I know. He goes, like, the, the, day, the day the impeachment hearings go go public, he's up there with the guy from Turkey as best friends. Yeah. And he's so. best friends with, he seems to be friends with the dictators and enemies with his allies. Right. I really do believe that, um, you know, he's hanging around dictators because you be also he is one too. Well, by beholding, we become changed, right? Change. Birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I mean, if, if people don't want to get that he's a dictator, look at who he hangs out with. Either way. Yeah, because he wasn't one to begin with. Right, right. And that's why he's friends with them. Exactly, exactly. He agrees with mentality. So you know, he doesn't take advice unless it comes through Fox News, like he did on December nineteenth. He black for. Um, I think this was the issue over the wall as well. Shift. Shiv did that in the hearings yesterday. He's like, you know, our president and that favorite TV show where he gets all his information from. Yeah. <laughs> like, she, he went, he was, yeah. it was crazy. And did you see he tweeted during yes, live? Sorry. Yep. Yep. That poor woman. It's amazing. Even the Republicans were uh, astounded that he did that. Yeah. That, you know what? I think that that might be when we're talking earlier in the previous study, that might have something to do with going to muster up some moral courage in some of these people when they see what we did. It's like, look, we're trying to help you. We're trying to support your stupidity and your bad behavior, but you're making it awfully hard for us to do that. I mean, how does that make them sound? But then there's the ones that came out and talked and you would, they are right on page with him and then just continue to say that there was no collusion. There was no collusion. And here they are accusing all this and they're they're supporting in those if i if i understood correctly they were supporting several of them were still supporting this whole ukraine thing that it's all real he had every right to go over to 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 have rudy giuliani what he was doing because ukraine is is the one that was interfering with our elections in 2016 which he has been told was not true wow it's really interesting like to see it because that mm. That's really going to happen. I mean, you have all these false accusers, right? You got these false people, and then you got people standing for truth. That's really coming to us. At the really. same time, you had that other guy convicted. I forget his name of like Stone. Stone, seven counts that proved that that what was his um, Trump and his people were actively knowing Russia was sending WikiLeaks information and really ready to help get the help in the election from Russia. So they knew it was Russia. But now they're going after CrowdStrike and whatever made up connection it has, you know, to Ukraine and everything. And the crazy thing is you look at those hearings and the Republicans are constantly saying, why are you here? You have no information about what happened with Trump on that telephone. Why are you here? And then they proceed to ask him all the information about um, Biden and his son, which they have no idea of. And I'm know. like, they have no idea of this, but you think they have idea of that and you yeah. get to ask them those questions? It was all distraction. I, I, A lot yeah. of it was for distraction. Yeah. I didn't get that. Right. It's distraction to keep the people off the mind of the purpose of why we're here. Right. And I didn't even get that because just because you weren't there to hear what was said doesn't mean somebody who was there that heard the phone conversation did not hear it. These you know. people went to the school uh, where they learned when you tell a lie often enough, over and over and over again, the lie becomes the truth. And that's what they're doing, is they're telling, they're doing it among other things, but they're telling their same lies. They're all repeating them over and over and over again. 
until we'll believe them. Yeah. You can tell a lie to me over and over and over again as long as you want. I'm not going to believe your lie. <laughs> but see, if you're not, because one lady put it very succinctly, she was like, first of all, you're saying these witnesses have no firsthand knowledges, but the witnesses that do have firsthand knowledge, the president won't allow to come here to, you know, speak before Congress. So yeah. stop, be quiet. Yeah. But if people aren't paying attention to the right news sources, they're not going to see that. Yeah. That's what's scary. What I was freaking about yesterday in, in devotional, I'm like, you literally, from that one decision of where you set your eyes, you already made your decision. Yeah. Because it's so deceptive right. to come out of that. It takes an act of God, literally. And wasn't it literally an act of God? Like, I mean, how much did our, how, yeah. much, how much further could we see because we had switched that our perspective? Like, yeah. to me, everything opened up, everything made sense, whereas before, everything that these Democrats were saying was a conspiracy and a lie. That's what my mentality was. So how could you possibly, you could only see, see as far as what, you know, our type of media was telling us. But as soon as that door opened up and you realized that it made no sense that these people were as, as that contrived and like, whatever, like Pelosi said it really well on the Stephen Colbert interview where she said, no one ever sets out in Congress, like Congress never sets out to impeach a president. It's the last resort. And they've given him so much leeway to continue doing what he could or to change his direction. And they kept giving him leeway, giving him leeway. And like she said, it's the last thing in the world that they want to do is, in, is impeach a president. They got to the point where they had no choice. And that made more sense to me than all these conspiracies that we had building up that these people were, were in some group mind think where they were trying to overthrow the president like it just didn't make any sense yeah so he gets his advice we know through fox news sean hannity informs him um and sean hannity gets it from his base so but we bring it to the internal and we're already seeing a transition in leadership it's moving between elder jeff and elder parmender we can mark it already happening right before raffia People are getting concerned because they think Elder Jeff is going to die. And remember, this was done back in April. And why would, why would we be thinking that he might die? They might try to take the connection with Abraham Lincoln, because we saw that Abraham Lincoln dies here. It's the same principle, but they're looking at some different people. They would say Moses, and they say names like Elijah went to heaven and Moses died. Therefore, they say Elder Jeff is going to be taken from us. I would say that's a misapplication of history and prophecy because it doesn't mark a death, but a transition. I don't think that it's marking something bad is going to happen to Elder Jeff. All it's marking is a change, a transition in the life cycle of this movement, just the same as we mark the life cycle of the United States. So in the last presentation, we saw that it was a, a transition in the life cycle of the United States. It's a change in, a, in, a change in the life cycle here in the movement. What were you going to say, Adriana? This is, this is pre-Jeff. Yeah. Leaving. Right. That's so there's a lot of question and answer in this one, and I tried to follow the dialogue and get it transcribed the best I could um, to where we can follow it. This was a clarification that was asked for on the external of Rafia. At Rafia, we mark a dictator in the United States. So looking at our line, the line of the priests, at Rafia, we mark a dictator. So there's a transition from one type of leadership to another type of leadership. It's a progressive work and you can mark it all at 2012. When is Paul the master of the ship? Long before it's obvious. So in 2012 to 2016, we parallel internal and external. It's Trump before and it's Trump after. It's also Elder Parmender before and Elder Parmender after. The process began years ago, but it's a process of time and progressive. We went into the histories of revolutions and we want to address people's fears about what that looks like because to fear that evil will happen to Elder Jeff is also making the same mistakes with history just because Moses died. So we have seen something different in Elder Jeff, but certainly not a death, a physical death anyways. So we know we saw Parminder here um, and Parminder here. We saw the work that was going into place to work on bringing Trump into, to, to, into play. And then we have Trump here. So we have dictatorship working in, in, the, in the works. 
So we went into the revolutions in our last study and we spent a lot of time on the Civil War. We also discussed the French Revolution and the rising of Napoleon. So you have the French Revolution here and the Civil War here. Um, you have the rise of Napoleon, which actually was a November 9 date. And these would be, as I was talking earlier, these are your, your midpoints here, which line up with 2014. These are your midpoints and these are your endpoints of these revolutions. So we know that the end point for 1863 lined up with, uh, was 1865 lined up with 2019. The end point for the French Revolution also was marking um, 2019. The French Revolution, when Napoleon becomes a dictator, is actually November 9. So we discussed the French Revolution and the rising of Napoleon. Then we took this concept of revolutionary history that we can identify between 9-11 and 2019. And that would be 9-11 here, 2014 and 2019. And then we looked at some other histories. We looked at the German Revolution and then there was this 11 day period leading up to the abdication of the Kaiser, which was November 9, 1918. We identified that a period of preparation began and a counter revolution. So this is where we had the, the German sailors where they were ordered to take the ships out to a suicide mission, a losing battle. They knew they were losing the war. <clears throat> And uh, Kaiser did not want the, the ships to all be taken by Britain, so he sends them on this suicide mission. They mutiny against the leadership and come and march on the barracks. Um, and then this actually brings the forcing of the Kaiser to abdicate. And that was November 9, 1918. So Abraham Lincoln lines up with 2019, but not November 9. The Kaiser lines up with November 9. Napoleon lines up with November, November 9. A rising with Napoleon, a death with the Kaiser. But all of it is marking a transition, not in a death. Historically, there's a death, but in our line, it's marking this transition from one life cycle to another. So um, we identified that period as preparation. So you had the, the period of preparation here, and then you had a counter revolution. We went to the Russian revolution and we identified it uh, between March and November of 1917. We marked Lenin as a dictator on November 9. So Lenin also marks the November 9. You've got the, the fall of the, the czar here in this period of time. Also, this is, uh, let me see, I don't know if it's in my notes here when it talks about, no, I don't think so. But when it talks about the Julian calendar, this is the, um, oh, the, the Gregorian, um, when you're talking Red about October. The other, yeah, yeah. yeah. Red October, why it's called Red October, yeah. because they were still using the Julian calendar. Um, but the palace was stormed, and then Petrograd, is that, or no, Petrograd, and then the palace, do I have that right? And then, um, and then you have uh, Lenin set up, and the uh, Lenin, then the first thing he does is restrict the press. That was October 27th, and on our Gregorian calendar is November 9, 1917. They begin this period of preparation and then a counter revolution. So we mark Lenin as a dictator and we mark a period of preparation. Uh, they begin the following year. So we're looking at, if we're looking at 2019 and November 9, this is where we're at here on our line is this period of preparation and then the counter revolution begins. What so, is that? We Hold don't, on. that's oh. what we're wanting to better understand is what, what the counter revolution looks like. What we do know is it's a revolution against the one that gets put in place. Yeah, I mean, I get that, but is that, um, what's that next one? Is that just a random line there or is that? What are you looking at? Sorry, the 1918. That's the counter revolution that right. happened during the Russian. So uh, you had the Russian revolution, then you had a little period in between, and then there was the counter revolution, the white terror. I get that, but on our line, if we were to line up, oh, we'll please. see that. Oh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you mean because when you're looking up here, what yeah, is it? no, because if you're looking yeah. at November 9th, we're right. going into a different dispensation. Correct. So. Correct. We're, yeah. going, we're also we're going into that preparation before Panium. Right. Right. And so the okay. counter revolution, I like, I guess if the counter revolution or the re revolution leading up to November 9th had to do with Trump, didn't it or? Hold on, sorry, Brother Jonathan, there's a little bit of soft talk. What did you say? The, um, if we're looking at November 9th, the revolution had to do with the 
basically the propping up of Trump. Is that what we're looking at there from 2001 to November 9? We're going to see that because there's a little bit on the lines coming up. Oh, okay. Um, it's not fully explained, but it, but we start going into our counter revolution because that's what we're learning as we enter into this dispensation. That's probably where the light is going to be shined on is, is more details on the counter revolution. Um, but we'll see where she marks it here in just a minute. So then we have the French revolution. We saw in itself, let's see, um, the French revolution. We saw that in itself, it came in the history of a revolution and a counter revolution. So the French revolution comes in a history of a revolution and a counter revolution. So we split, we split it between the reign of terror and the white terror. The first five years leading up to the 27th of July that we can mark as November 9. And if you remember, November, July 27 was because they were using the French Revolution calendar that was in Thermidori, the 9th of November was the, on the Thermidori, called the Thermidorian Reaction. Their July 7, 27 lined up with our November 9 on the actual Gregorian calendar. So it's interesting that you have a, a Julian calendar here that would coordinate with Gregorian calendar November 9. You have the Thermidorian here, the month of Thermidorian, I think is what it's called, on their French Revolution calendar that, that lines up with our November 9. So this is a revolutionary calendar in the ninth day of the 11th month. The 11th month is known as Thermidor. There's time of, a time of preparation and then a counter-revolution that works contrary to the reign of terror. So the counter-revolution works contrary to the reign of terror. So who was fighting in this one, they're going to fight against. Okay, if wait, I said wait, that wait. right. Before you go, sorry. Because I'm trying to remember from last week when we went over that Thermidorian. They were going with that calendar at the same time, the Julian and the, the Gregorian. Um, sorry, it was the Russians that were still using. So um, I, I don't know if anybody was using the Julian calendar at this time. Oh. At this time in the Russian Revolution, they were one of the only ones, I believe, left using the Julian calendar. Pretty much everybody else has switched over to the Gregorian. But during the French Revolution. Yeah, when did that? that calendar the french revolution no the, yeah the, the, the they specifically did that during the french revolution to do away with the seven day work week they introduced a 10 10 day week and wanted to eliminate anything that had to do with god and the, the way of life well that's interesting because yeah that's the seven, that's 1789 so that was way before the julian calendar how that the date it was way before the julian calendar the thermidorian Calendar? No, the Julian calendar calendar went. I don't remember when it started, but it was hundreds of years. Yeah. Oh, so it started, started in Rome. Yeah, yeah. Way when and Rome the Gregorian, was. Gregorian. I don't remember the date of the Gregorian, but by 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 the time of the Russian Revolution, most everybody was on the Gregorian calendar, but Russia was still using the Julian. I'm just wondering where did they get that their Medorian calendar? They made from? it up. <laughs> they made it up. They made it up. Okay. They specifically yeah. made it up in the wow. French Revolution. It was a French Revolutionary calendar. It lasted for a few years, right? Basically, yeah. I didn't oh, even. <laughs> yeah. So, a summary of what we saw we began by looking at 2014, and we saw that there's a midpoint or midway between 9 11 or 2001 and 2019. So, we saw the midpoint here, um, 2014. It's a prophetic midpoint by looking into history, particularly using the 151 and the 220. The 151. There's your midway point. And then you have the 151, and I was right when I said that. Yeah, the 151 takes you to 2019 um, in the American Civil War, and the 220 takes us to the French Revolution. And then we were able to identify that 2001 to 2019 is the American Revolution or Civil War. It's a period of revolution in the United States. Like we saw, it's going from one type of government to another. So the revolution is to turn over from one type of government to the other. So wow. 1863, um, using the 151, takes you to 2019. Um, in the French Revolution, going back to 1794, using the 220 takes you to 2019. So, so, wait, so does that mean the counter-revolution is going to take us back to the old count government? Because isn't that kind of what happened in France? Hopefully we'll understand it more as we go through because I don't want to say it Because I was wondering if it's the revolution that's coming 
is against the one who's in power. It's coming right before the election of that guy who needs to be elected again. And so, they're going to fight against him, but they're going to lose. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking, that made me think. So when, I kind of lost my thought, but um, where you have that. So it's basically um, the Constitution and establishment of our um, government. So the counter-revolution is going to be fighting for that, right? Because this, this a revolution that came out was a breaking away from that constitution and the counter-revolution will be trying to trying restore to try the constitution. To, yeah. okay. And to get rid of the one that just got put in place. Okay. And they're going to be where other... Have, Go ahead. Where, where you have um, the U.S. Civil War, we struggled a little bit with this one too because it was it was just one big war. But at 1863, you're marking the midpoint. Um, I forget how you just worded it. It's like a new leadership or something happens at that point in a revolution. Is that correct? I don't know that that's the case with the Civil War. The Civil War is used for different to make different points. If I'm going to explain that correctly, the Civil War marks the um, the working of the Union of Church and State. There was a tide that turned in 1863. The South was winning, and now the North was winning. That's what I was wondering, yeah. But it wasn't a change of leadership, because it's in, it's the 1863 is 2014. It's um, 1865 that lines up with 2019, where you have the two right. dictators change. But that but the midpoint that is comes, changing South to North. Yeah, that still makes sense as a switch of leadership, especially in a democracy where the leadership is in the people. So if the persuasion is now if it's switched at that time between the south and the north and that makes good sense yeah so the tide turned well that's interesting so you have fighting against the leader and the government and if i'm understanding that right right but there's no change in leadership in 1863 i, I don't think no so. oh it's just a turning of yeah. the the battle between the king of the north and the king of the south who's winning and who isn't right. basically oh. right which side oh okay. and the north that's began to the, the north okay. the south was losing between the North was losing between 1861 to 1863, and then in 1863 it turned and the North began to win. Okay. So if this is revolution, we then considered the German Revolution and saw if we could overlay that on our history. So we took the concept of a revolution and started overlaying them. This is the German Revolution. It ends World War One. It's 11 days and they're fighting against their government. And on November 9, 1918, their king is forced to abdicate and there's a new leader. Then because this new leadership is still weak, he's weak because he has so much opposition. So if that would represent Trump, um, those that are opposing him prepare to fight him. So the ones that are opposing, um, let's see, the new leadership. The new leader is Frederick Ebert. I'm going back to the previous study, Frederick Ebert. So let's see, back up just a little bit. Their king is forced to abdicate, and there's a new leader. The new leader is Frederick Ebert. And uh, then, because the new leadership is still weak, he's weak because he has so much opposition. Those that are opposing him prepare to fight him. And then, early the following year, so they prepare to fight him. And early the following year, they begin a counter revolution to remove him from government, but they fail. So, Frederick Ebert becomes the new leader, but he's got opposition. He's got the Spartacists that are fighting against him as well. So, there are different leaderships here trying to, to fight to win the power of the government. Um, that comes to an end, then this counter-revolution begins, and this counter-revolution is to take out this new leader. And Okay, so Ebert goes all the way right to the end of the counter-revolution. Oh. No, I think so. I, I think oh, so. Never mind, never mind. Okay. And I don't remember the history of the Spartacists, but, um, but that counter-revolution ends. I was all, it almost made me think of the impeachment hearings, but at the same time, I can't apply that there. Um, but because, I don't know, it made me think of that, but because that's kind of in a different um, time. Well, yeah, because the, that's what I was asking about this. I've not heard anything mentioned about it with October 30th, when you have the, 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 the German sailors that mutiny against the leadership and it forces the Kaiser to abdicate. I mean, we're not gonna see Donald Trump abdicate. Um, but you do see that his own, that Germany's own people go against the leadership. Mm -hmm. 
and and I was thinking about that is that like some of the Republicans after he after he withdrew the troops from Syria that even the Republicans were some of the Republicans were um, having a problem with that. So I, I don't know. It's interesting when you look at all the all the different revolutions together. The one that is the U.S. one, the eighteen sixty one to sixty five. We don't see a leader switching at that 1863 point either. So in this, when we're looking at the German one, we see an actual switch from Kaiser to Frederick Ebert. But in our history, if we look at November 9th in our history, it's just like the, the other American history where you don't actually see a leader being switched out. It's more like the persuasion of the people. So now there's the persu persuasion of the people with November 9th with the, it's called again, impeachment. It's like there's this period and the counter-revolution, it's, it's not going to be, a, it's still going to have, have everything to do with Trump. I don't know if I'm making any sense. Like I'm just drawing the, the connection why that Civil War one was there because it wasn't actually, it didn't fit the way all the other revolutions kind of did, but it had an, another characteristic, which was the beginning you had the South and then the, afterwards you had the North. And it's when you're looking at the South and the North, you're looking at Democrats and Republicans. Correct. in that time period so it's almost like you're we're looking at the same thing it's not about trump being abdicated at november 9th it's about a switch in power i guess if that's and, what i don't know if that's what we're looking at or that that's what we should be looking at and also what also went with this was the steps that they were taking through this and how it switched from the north to the south or how they believe it changed from the north to, or south to the north was they believed they were losing because they took God out of their government. And so oh, yeah. they decided to put God back in their government here and then they start winning. And she makes a comment in one of the classes that we went through, it's like, for the not on this particular point, but God doesn't make the test easy because here they are thinking that God is not in their government. And so they put God in the government to stop the punishment and stop their losing. And what happens? The tide turns and they start to win. I know internally we can see to know what is right and wrong. Who starts winning? Wait, say that again. So really quick, it's important. I, I know that the North was the good side. That's what we know because right. they were against slavery. Yes. But when it came to church and state, they were on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. So the wrong, the North was losing. And then they entered God into the government because they saw this crisis, which was the Civil War. And that's when the North started to win. So the Republicans started to win. Wait, so the North were the ones who were... Uh, the Republicans started to yes. win when the North put God in. Yes. Mix. Okay. The so North was the Republicans. Whoa. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, the they switched. Just, I know you just. <laughs> was, I had it, and then you just threw that in there. So it's like. Go <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>, ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just. Yeah, I'm going along with that too because that's right. I forgot that the there was a switch. You know, the Republicans and the Democrats are are almost on opposite sides as they were back then. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, the Republicans are still the religious right. And so here you, you don't, yes, you have the, you don't have a death here. You have a Kaiser abdicating. You have one form of government going down and another form of government rising up. And this counter revolution is to going to counter that one that's rising up. So you have the Kaiser that is, is going down. You have Frederick Ebert that is going up. But then they have, I don't remember the, the whole, all the history and the Spartacists. It was brief in there and, and then ended, I think, on November 19th. But they were involved in this, and I don't remember the details. I had it in the previous um, slide. But, but when they do this counter-revolution to remove him from government, they fail. I have a question. Do you remember when Perminder put out the study under new management? Did that come out November 19th? Nine or after from Australia? It came out that weekend. I thought it even came out a day or two before November. Uh, maybe not. Okay. Because, like, that's even internally, we see uh, we are under new management, and you know, now the old management has gone into darkness, and we're under a new. But that was actually recorded. If I, if that's that's the camp meeting, right? The first two that got posted on the camp meeting, it was actually recorded earlier on in the week. It says oh. November second. Oh, uh, it so it was oh. actually before. It says November second, okay. but I think that because of the internet, maybe I don't know how 
how it says November 2nd, because I was thinking that when it was first uploaded, it was actually the day that I saw it come out was like well after it actually said that it was posted. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I kind of remember. That's what, okay. I don't know. For me, saw, I don't the, know oh, I know what it is. The, it, the date they have on there is the date it was recorded, but I think if you go on to it, the date it was posted was several days later because they had no internet with the fires and all that stuff. Yeah. So, That's probably why. So in the history of the French Revolution, we've also applied the, the French Revolution in a first application, and then this is our second application. This is the one that, that uh, throws me just a little bit. So we have a second application in the French Revolution. So the French Revolution, you have the entire thing, this 10-year period of time, where we've used it and we saw it lined up with the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, okay? And that's the first application. And then this is our second application where you take that history and you spread it out and you let and you make this November 9 line up with um, 2019. And she's gonna go through these details a little bit more. And so this is where I get a little bit, myself have to still learn it as we go through this. And who it is that's fighting is Robespierre and the Jacobins are fighting. They bring the fall of the monarchy. Do I have that right? Um, and then, then that that fall or the oh somebody help me here with the destruction of the Jacobins. But then they they're going to go fight against them. I'm going to tongue tie myself and get it wrong. So let's keep going on. So we split this into two periods of five years. But when we actually go into a closer look at the revolution, it also comes in these in these two parts that we've observed. So you have the whole thing is 10 years or you split it into two, two five-year parts. The first five years is the monarchy being overthrown by the Jacobins and Robespierre. This is the reign of terror where they kill a lot of people. This period ends on the 27th of July, which in the calendar is the ninth day of the 11th month. They made their own calendar and their version of November 9th <laughs> is the day that Robespierre in his faction is overthrown. All those opposed to him, Robespierre, and to the Jacobins, took time to prepare. So those that are opposed to Robespierre and the Jacobins take time to prepare before they try to wipe out the Jacobins in France. So there are some differences with this one compared to the Russian and German revolutions. But this is the Jacobins persecuting the monarchy and those wealthy classes. In this counter-revolution, the same people the Jacobins were persecuting fight back. So in the counter-revolution, the ones that were, let's see, the, the same people the Jacobins were persecuting fight back. So they were persecuting the wealthy, correct? Yeah, they were persecuting the monarchy and those wealthy classes. So they fight back. Right. And they try to remove the Jacobins from France. The wealthy classes do? Yeah. They're the counter-revolution? Yeah. The monarchy That's and the wealthy one. classes. Didn't we just have Bloomberg enter the democratic yes. elections? Yes. <laughs> or he's attempting to. If he yeah. has it, yeah, I don't know if he has officially, but it sounds like that's what he's looking to do. Because the, the left has been pretty gung-ho with, I was looking into democratic socialism yesterday because everyone's endorsing Bernie Sanders because of it, this democratic idea of socialism. And it's so anti-rich people that the rich people are like freaking out now. They're like, wait a minute. <laughs> and then this study this morning that God has his people to go to the rich and talk to them. I'm wondering how it's all going to fit together. Anyways. That's interesting because um, that you say that they, they're doing this special thing on the NBC Nightly News and they're asking like the Democrats, you know, what they believe in, what they stand for. And they interviewed him and then they said, I think it was about taxes or something. I think the same person, I can't remember if it's him or not. But he asked them, well, what about, because he wants to tax the wealthy, right? He wants Bernie to, Sanders? No, not Bernie Sanders, no. but the Bloomberg. Bloomberg. What is, uh, or somebody else. Bloomberg wants to tax the wealthy? Know. Never mind. He's the woman, the lady. Yeah, but they said, well, what about you? Maybe I'm mixed up, sorry. There's like millions yeah, of I Democratic know. candidates. <laughs> who knows? Who know. but, the, but the interesting question was that, okay, you want to do that, but he's a wealthy guy himself. The point is, is that he's asking, well, what about you? Mm -hmm. You know? So it's, that's really interesting. Yeah. So we have two applications that she's showing us here for the French Revolution. 
first one being the 10 years that, that you can see line up with the Civil War. It takes you from 2001, 2014 to 2019. And this other application that is going to actually demonstrate our counter-revolution on our line. So ending here um, at November 9, for us, what we just went through, there's a period of preparation, and then there's going to be a counter-revolution. And that's what the um, Civil War actually does not show us. So what we're marking as a pattern is this middle column. The beginning dates do not give us information, at least combined at this stage of our understanding as far as time is concerned, neither do the endpoints, but it is the middle column. So this middle column is the one that we're marking to show us the events that take place here. You've got Napoleon rising as a dictator, Abraham Lincoln's death as a dictator, you have the Kaiser advocating a new leader rising up. Lenin restricts the press. He becomes a dictator. And down here, you have the Thermidorian reaction. So you have each of these characteristics showing us the transition that is taking place at November 9th. And the German, the Russian, and the second application of the French Revolution show us the counter-revolution, the period of preparation, period of preparation, period of preparation, and a counter-revolution. We also had Robert Bloom, Blum, Bloom, and that was November 9th, on, uh, 1848, and this is a separate revolution. As we read, symbolically, his death ended the revolution. When this leader is executed, it shows that the revolution against the government is futile. So. Um, and she's going to go into that. I'll just read what she says. But it was two years before the loud cry. So we could show that as two years before our loud cry was when Donald Trump is elected. And when Donald Trump is elected, it shows that the revolution is futile. So November 9, 1848, we apply that. And um, futile meaning pointless. Pointless. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When he was elected, it's pointless to try to fight it. It's going all the way through. So we apply it to 2016 as a turning point where our position would be futile at the end of the election of Donald Trump, November 9, 2016. Once they reject Hillary Clinton, all hope of stopping this revolution is futile. In that sense, we can mark the Republican horn broken because it's progressive. But after 2016, it's inevitable. There was another reason to place it in 2016 from the Millerite history. It was two years before the loud cry. So when we make it 2016, if we compare the internal and the external, it's two years before a loud cry. So by looking at the revolution and the fact that it didn't end there, and by seeing it as an internal Millerite waymark, we can see that it's not their closed door in the same way it doesn't end the revolution. It exists in the history of the Russian Revolution two years before a loud cry. Or, or 2016, but you can still mark on November 9. So this is the November 9 in history that would take us to Donald Trump's election. So if everybody followed that, it is in November 9 where you mark the death of Robert Bloom, but it's two years before the loud cry. So we take that 1850 loud cry to our 2018 loud cry, November 9, 1848 to November 9, 2016. And it shows at this point in time that the, to fight this revolution is futile. And it marks a November 9 at his election. So the middle column that we were, I don't have my box around it, but we'll all get the idea. The middle column here takes us to the end of a revolution. We can connect the 9th of November the ninth day of the 11th month. Following that, there's a time period of preparation where the enemies combine forces to fight against what he set up. Um, they, where the enemies combine forces to fight against what he set up here in this middle column. So the enemies set up to fight against what was set up here. Then early the following year, his counter revolution begins, which we're marking at 2020. So we have the 2020 up here, and we'll see where that lines up with and how that comes in. So, um, and that 2020 counter, it fails. 
We should also note that this is an election year, 2020. We need to look into why this is known as white terror in two different histories. Whether or not we want to take white as a symbol or whether or not we consider the division of race that is happening, it's something that we need to think about. So we're going to detour just a teeny bit um, because she doesn't go into white terror and I'm just going to share a couple things. I don't know what all it means. So we'll share the, the um, slides here that show it. But everybody, is everybody um, doing okay so far in what we're talking about? Be honest. Huh? Is that a yes? What do you no, think? I said be honest. Following slowly. <laughs> oh, following slowly. Slowly? Hey, it's taken me a long time to get this far, and I still don't understand um, pieces of it. But, but what we are seeing is, th is this transition period here where there's a new government, there's an overturning, whether it be the rise of a dictator, the death of a dictator, the Kaiser abdicating, it's demonstrating this overthrowing, this, this revolution to overthrow the established government and set up a new government. And it all marks November 9, 2019. Then we go into a period of preparation um, and then those that those there are those that fought here are going to fight against this new government that is put in place I would, I would suggest for anyone who hasn't watched the videos recently because we are kind of in a time where there's not a whole lot coming out these are good ones the four pack uh revolutions probably really good ones to yeah. go yeah. back yeah it'll it'll make it exactly. after doing this it'll make a lot more sense yeah exactly yes Especially why we're in this and i think that's just you know, uh, the time the Lord has given us to still gather up for anybody that's come in recently to be able to gather up and go back. And I'll just say for, for my own testimony that, you know, we, most of us were all present um, in, in the, as back in October, the, in 2018. Um, but it took us about, for me, my own personal self, you know, I was listening to the presentations, but it wasn't until he put us all on, on doing the, the studies that we're doing where we're each individual taking portions and, and preparing the notes and presenting the, the messages that has helped every one of us. It has truly helped me to take step by step through the Brazil classes to go through and understand it. And I can't say that I understand all things, but I have a lot better understanding than had I not done that. So anybody that's not understanding and you're still here you're still a priest take it and try to go through it systematically piece by piece at the same time as new information comes out we certainly have to keep up um, but i know that we're also in a period of time where we're coming up to um great persecution from uh, our time of trouble okay um as you were as you were reading all this i went and looked up like some of the names like I didn't know about the, 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 the Dorian reaction uh -huh. um, so I went and looked that up and they have a lot of um, pieces on it so um, even though we go watch also the DVDs we could also look up these names and these dates and they got like a lot of information about it and then also I posted on the teachers fellowship um, the dates and everything with the Julian in the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> when it started, when the, it the is. Thermidorian reaction was just that was. Hmm. It was just the calendar that the French were using. It was like a ten day a week calendar. Their calendar. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been November 9th, but on ours it was. Well, it, it gave. It, I just. It just. I just put it up there because it gave the dates when it started, when it began, who did it, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. This is information. Okay, so. When she talks about white terror, so I still have some questions because I ran across a couple of things and I think I brought up my question when it came to white terror. So um, not that we're going to read all this, but it's in the slides if you want to look it up. But the first white terror was 1794 to 1795, a movement against the French Revolution. So this is the period after they had the French Revolution and then this counters the French Revolution. The second white terror is 1815, a movement against the French Revolution. Um, white terror in Russia, mass violence carried out by opponents of the Soviet government during the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the Russian Civil Wars from 1918 to 1920. 
So there's different examples here and you could look up on the links, each one of them. The white terror was a period during, this is just one. I think it sounds I used opposite this one. to our time. Huh? It sounds opposite to our time. It sounds what? Opposite. Keep going. <laughs> French Revolution was like, you know, the Republicans coming into power. So white terror would have been against the Republicans coming into our power, but that's opposite because the, the Democrats aren't about white terror and racism. Because she said earlier, we have to think about it in terms of it's like, you know, white versus black in the culture and the division. So I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But the next slide, I have a question on. I think it's the next one. So um, anyway, so this was, um, this is just from this white, this white, this first one. That's what I pulled up here just to make the connection. I didn't put them all in there. So the white terror was a period during the French Revolution in 1795 when a wave of violent attacks swept across much of France. The victims of this violence were people identified as being associated with the reign of terror. So the victims of the violence are those that are associated with the reign of terror, the followers of Robespierre. So the victims are the Jacobins and Robespierre. Um, and members of the Jacobin clubs. The violence was perpetrated primarily by those whose relatives or associates have been victims of the Great Terror or whose lives and livelihoods had been threatened by the government and its supporters before the Thermidorian reaction. Principally, these were in Paris, the Muscadins, and in the countryside, monarchists, supporters of the mm, Girondins, Girondins, those who opposed the civil constitution of the clergy and those who otherwise hostile to the Jacobin political agenda. So who would the Jacobins be? I guess that's what we need to understand. In our line, who would Robespierre and the Jacobins be? Isn't that gonna be Trump and the right, the far right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Great Terror had been largely an organized political program based on laws such as the law of 22, Real, whatever that is, and enacted through official institutions such as Revolutionary Tribunal. But the White Terror was essentially a series of uncoordinated attacks by local activists who shared common perspectives but no central organization. In particular locations, there were, however, more organized counter revolutionary movements, such as the Companions of Jihu in Lyon and the Companions of the Sun in Provence. The name white terror derives from the white cockades worn in the, in the hats of royalists. So elaborate on what you were saying then. Mm. If the Jacobins are Donald Trump in, in the far right to, that are causing this revolution. Because in our time, white terror is when racists attack people of ethnic or like make them feel afraid. I just looked up that law of 22 per whatever. Uh -huh. um, it's, oh, actually, cool. it's kind of interesting because it says uh, on the wiki page, among other things down it said where it says purpose, it has uh, seven, six points for its purpose. And the first one says the law extended the reach of the revolutionary tribunal, which henceforth could hear cases for slandering. Oh, there's a lot of noise coming through there. Um, which henceforth could hear cases for slandering patriotism seeking to inspire dis discouragement, spreading false news, and depraving morals, corrupting the public conscience, and impairing the purity and energy of the revolutionary government. So it's talking about false news, um, patri slandering patriotism. It, it, this sounds a lot more like the Trump kind of movement. Than, and there's five more there, but I won't go through them because I haven't read them yet. It just seemed interesting because that was the law that these that this movement was bringing in. Okay. We're we're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of stuff to try to get organized. Yeah. So the white terror in Russia refers to the organized violence and mass killings carried out by the white army during the Russian Civil War. It began after the Bolsheviks seized power in 1917 and continued until the defeat of the white army at the hands of the Red Army. The White Army fought the Red Army for power, which engaged in its own Red Terror. According to some Russian historians, the White Terror was a series of premeditated actions directed by their leaders. 
although this view is contested by others. Estimated for those killed in the white terror vary between 20,000 and 100,000 people, as well as much higher estimates of 300,000 deaths. Deb, I just tried to Google white terror, and the first thing that comes up, and it's multiple things only about this that come up, and it's in Taiwan, where they had some big revolution and this government come in, um, the 228 incident, and then immediately after they had this white terror come in in May 19, 1949 to July 15, 1987. It lasted 38 years of martial law. Interesting, but that was oh. a white terror incident of a counter revolution. That's on that list on the previous slide. I can't back up right now. The Taiwan? Yeah, it's on that list. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, is that it? No. No, I can't back up right now. It won't let me, the thing to back up isn't showing there until I finish the slide, but I that's, guess. But Taiwan was on that list as well. Yeah, I'm reading it now. 70 years after Wow. Well. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you play around a little bit more. I know. It's pretty easy. It's just this click or that click. Doesn't yeah. matter. So the White Army, the volunteer army in South Russia became the most prominent and the largest of the various and dis disparate white forces. Starting off as a small and well-organized military. So are what you saying, Adriana, is it's going to be martial law? Is that what you're thinking it looks like? No, it's just what Google was saying about that one. Okay. So it's organized military in January 1918. The volunteer army soon, soon grew. The Kuban Cossacks joined the white army and conscription of both peasants and Cossacks began. In late February 1918, 4,000 soldiers under the command of General Oleski Kaladin were forced to retreat from Rostov-on-Don due to the advance of the Red Army. In what, began, what became known as the Ice March, they traveled to Kuban in order to unite with the Kuban Cossacks, most of whom did not support the volunteer army. In March 3000, men under the command of General Viktor Pokrovsky joined the volunteer army, increasing its membership to 6,000, and by June to, to 9,000. In 1919, the Don Cossacks joined the army. In that year, between May and October, the volunteer army grew from 64,000 to 150,000 soldiers and was better supplied than its red counterpart. The white army's rank and file comprised activists, active anti-Bolsheviks, such as Cossacks, nobles, and peasants as conscripts and as volunteers. So in the Russian Revolution, it was fighting against, because the, the revolution was the Bolsheviks to overturn the government, right? Lenin gets put into place. Then the counter-revolution is the white army or white terror where the Cossacks, the nobles, and the peasants, and the, as conscripts and volunteers, <clears throat> join the army. So that does seem like Adriana was saying, like it seems like the white terror is, I mean, in that, in that history, that's the white terror was against Lenin, wasn't it? Against Lenin? the Bolsheviks, yeah. Lenin was with the Bolsheviks, right? Yeah, that's right. In every history, whatever radical government just got placed in the white terror is against that. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I was confused. So I'm like, so we're right. going to see the white terror that's against Donald Trump. Yeah, and it's going to be the Democrats that are the white terror. So I'm going to throw in my question. Good Scott. And I don't, I don't know what this means, but when I was reading this last week, there was just this piece stuck out in me. But you can read the whole speech that he gives. Um, without assenting to this strong representation of the increasing strength and stability of slavery, without denouncing what of untruth pervades it, I own myself not too insensible to the many difficulties and discouragements that beset us on every hand. They fling their broad and gloomy shadows across the pathway of every thoughtful colored man in this country. For one, I see them clearly and feel them sadly. With an earnest aching heart, I have long looked for the realization of the hope of my people. Standing as it were barefoot and treading upon the sharp and flinty rocks of the present and looking out into the boundless sea of the future, I have sought in my humble way to penetrate the intervening mists and clouds and perchance to 
that's decry, not death cry, right? Decry. This cry, I don't think so. In the dim and shadowy distance, the white flag of freedom, the precise speck of time at which the cruel bondage of my people should end, and the long entombed millions rise from the foul grave of slavery and death. But of that time, I can know nothing, and you know nothing. All is uncertain at that point. One thing, however, is certain. Slaveholders are in earnest and mean to cling to their slaves as long as they can and to the bitter end. They show no sign of a wish to quit their iron grasp upon the sable throats of their victims. Their motto is a firmer hold and a tighter grip. For every new effort that is made to break their cruel power, the case is one of life or death with them and they will give up only when they must do that or do worse. That is so true. So when I read that, he didn't see it. He's looking for the precise speck of time at which the cruel bondage of my people should end and the long entombed millions rise from the foul grave of slavery and death. We know that this is about um, racism, right? One of the one of, racism and equality. And we know that that we're going to see this contrast of black and white, Christ and Satan, and the lines are being defined. And this this white flag of freedom. I, I don't know if there's a, if it's an application or not, but this white flag of freedom, you're going to see people rise up against the government that's just put in place, which in, puts everyone in, in the bondage. literal context. I think though, I think what he's talking about is you, the South needs to wave that white flag saying they give right. up. Right. Yeah. So you, you can't have the Democrats waving the white flag saying they give up. It depends because there's, there's white terror and then there's waving the white flag saying I'm, I yeah, give up. That was kind of different, the white flag. Yeah. You have a different symbolism. Okay. So we'll cross but that. White, this white flag of freedom, is that, that's not the giving up white flag, is it? Because of the last sentence, sentence in this, the case is of one of life and death to them and they will not give up only when they must do that or do worse so they're he's talking about them giving up their what they're doing because it says instead they say a firmer hold and a tighter grip and they just won't let go yeah like they they want to cling to their slaves they don't want slavery to end yeah. they want to keep it as long as it as long as they can have it and no, even when it seems to be loosened, when people fight against it, they seem to enforce more laws or to put more things in place so that they can continue to keep on doing what they're doing. Yeah, and the context of this history back, if we look at the natural, like, like Parmenter says, this was the history where their warfare was two little battalions smacking at each other all day long. And the only way through all the midst and the, the chaos you would see if the other side gives up so you stop shooting at them is if they wave a little white flag. That was their symbol. That right. was their sign to say, stop, stop shooting at us, we give up. So, and he says, um, in the dim and shadowy distance, the white flag of freedom. So he's just, you know, it's that same warfare scenario, but that white flag would have been a flag of surrender. I'm right. wondering. I was just looking that up. Or maybe I missed all that. Um, because the white, the surrender flag doesn't sound like freedom. I, I, maybe I missed what you're explaining there. I don't know. Uh, Her or me, because I probably have it totally wrong. I just, I, I just was looking at the white, trying to figure out what white terror is, and and it happened to be the same day I was running across this. Listening, I was listening to the abolitionist video, and I heard him say that, and I went and looked it up, and and it just started thinking about the whole bigger picture, not, not, and I know you have to understand the context in the back and the actual history, but I'm looking at the whole end scenario of this white flag of freedom that is coming, that freedom is in Christ, that in the end, it'll be this white flag of freedom on all mankind, the slavery that is at the yes. end going to be. Were you going to say something? No, no, I'm just, I'm thinking. This history with Dred Scott, that's American history, right? That's not French. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. American. That's American. Yeah. Yeah, if you look up the white flag, flag it's just about surrender. surrender. Yes, yeah, it is. So there's one other history we want to add to this. We haven't yet looked at some of the waymarks that take us to 2019. So we're going to have to take a leap 
And this is something that I was talking about, that we can take the number 490, cut it in half, and see 245. Treating it, at, in, at, treating it the same way we would treat the 2520. So we've taken the 490 time prophecy and cut it in half the same way we would the 2520 to see these two periods of 245. So we want to look at the 245 because the history that it takes us to is the history of this, not the Civil War, but the American Revolution. We're going to add it to this line. So we're going to add the, the American Revolution to the line of the Civil War. This is where I got a little bit confused. So because where does the American Revolution fit in history compared to the Civil War? The war beforehand if you're, thinking, if you're thinking about their independence before, before. Yeah. 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 yeah before so we're going to add it to this line of the civil war to the american civil war when we look at the american civil war how much of the story does it give us so we look at the civil war we look at all we don't have all the lines on this one because i couldn't always fit them on there and get our text in there too but when we look at all these they all these two, the French Revolution, except now we have a second application for the French Revolution, the Civil War is missing this section. Okay? It's missing the Counter Revolution. Okay? So we're going to add it to the line of the Civil War, uh, in, but let's see, half of it because we're missing this history. But if we take the 245 from 2019, it takes us not to the history of the American Civil War, but to the American Revolution. And if we go from 2019, it takes us to 1774. So 245 to 2019 takes you to, to 2019 takes you to, um, to, uh, to, I'm sorry, I'm saying that all wrong. The 245 takes you from 1774 to 2019. So 1865 we placed because 1863 was a midpoint and then 1865 becomes a symbol, the end point. 1865 is 2019. So we're taking a different logic. This is the 245 and it takes us to 1774. This is the American Civil War and this is the American Revolution. In 1774, Benjamin Franklin convinces the different colonies to form one representative body known as the First Continental Congress. The Civil War gives us this half the, the half between 2001, here we go, 2001 to 2019. And the American Revolution gives us the other half. 1774, the 245 takes us to 2019. So the Civil War gives us half of our revolution and the American Revolution gives us the other half. A couple of Americans don't like to see this as a revolution, the American Revolution as a revolution that we would count because the Civil War is internal. And this is the United States against Britain. But we need to remember that the government was Britain, both the civil wars or, or revolutions. Some young Americans don't like to be reminded they once had a king, but now they're in agreement. So wait a minute. So she's placing this, okay. So she's placing the counter revolution. Sorry, never mind. But she's placing this after because I'm my mind yeah. is now cast. Um, yes. Um, so she's taking the civil war which is 1861 to 1865 right. as the first half of this history, 2001 to 2019. Right, right. So we have 2019 to go on to the end in the counter-revolution, and this civil war only gave us this And how half. does she explain how she did that? How she <laughs> Using that? the 245. I know, I get that, but how is she justifying her putting that after when that actually happened in court? I, that, other than the 245, that's all I saw. So I think... Um, who, who explained that to me? Someone who explained this to me on the weekend, I'm probably going to brutalize it, but if you take seven, where, where the end of the Civil War, where it says right now you have 1774, 1774 marks 2019. Okay? <laughs> right. Yes. So that's, that's technically a 2019. Um, and, oh, I don't remember exactly how it was explained, but if you take the what's going to end up on this line, the new one that's coming after, it's going to rep be a representative of, I, I'm, I can't do it. <laughs> I, I know that it, it made sense, like, because that you're attaching the two because, oh, man, I can't do it. Sorry. I, I know how you feel. 
<laughs> so, so if you have, go ahead. No, you done? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was so defeated. <laughs> okay, so 1865 lines up with 2019, right? Because it's the end point of the Civil War. We've got this middle column here all the way down, um, and I don't have all of them on here, but you have this middle column that all represented 2019, some of them specifically November 9th. 1865 it represents the end point because we had a midpoint of 1863, the midpoint being 2014, so you had an end point of 2019. So you got here by the 151. So what she took was the 490, which is the biggest of the prophecy, taking you all the way back to the Diet of Spires. She took the 245 and she cut it in half and looked to see where it took her. The 245 from 219 took you to 1794. I mean 1774. And in 1774, Benjamin Franklin convinces the different colonies to form one representative body known as the First Continental Congress. So there is, um, this is, um, you know, being free from Britain, this revolution is now to, be, to become free from Britain here, and they become one representative body. So I guess in a sense what you're talking about is this marking Trump and whatever it is that he's doing in forming and establishing his government because you see an established body coming in 1774. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense to me. So, um, so yes, it comes after and it's gonna demonstrate, it's gonna demonstrate a different battle for a different purpose. So it's a civil war, basically, and it's a civil war here. But this one just happens to come after this one. But the 2019 is the common thread that connects them. The 1865 is connected by the 151. The 1774 is connected by 245. And we know that she's taken and done all these numbers in half, which we went on that one Friday night when we went through it. So you've got the Civil War, the American Civil War, and then the American Revolution. And this gives us the other half. And this is, I believe, what is going to be, because it's not really developed that I got out of this particular study. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be something that, that more light is going to be coming on as we yeah, go through. I think so, too, with that, because you still, I'm still kind of lost in how, I mean, I understand it, but I'm that there's still there's a counter-revolution coming, yeah. and there's a preparation coming, but... No, I, I I get all of yeah 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 all of that, but then still placing that and the American Civil War after the actual um, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 well that would cause some people's minds to stretch or give up. No, I don't. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. <laughs> yeah. <I'll continue. laughs> Is that revolution? <laughs> 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 what <I> mean? <laughs> because I mean I've learned I, I, prayerfully we've all learned our lesson. Yeah. To, to let things develop and see where they go and, That's uh, what I'm saying, and so. test it out yeah. yep. and test I mean, it out because you could see in something like this and this was done back in April yeah so you could see that throwing something out this something like this really back in April would have caused people to yeah no I'm not buying that and then they <laughs> wind up losing the whole you know, God is going to give us bits and pieces and he's not going to explain all the bits and pieces mm -hmm. all at once. He's yeah. going to ask us to keep following on by faith and, and letting the message develop. So using the prophetic numbers, the 220, the 151, um, I think I said 151, yeah, the 151 to the 2019, but it's not a literal. But anyway, so you have a, so you have the two, four, uh, this one was not a literal if I remember right. Um, so you have the 245 bringing you back to 1774, though, and that marks as uh, lines up with 2019. So in 1774, they set up the first representative body of the colonies known as the First Continental Congress. This is the seed of where the American government begins. The French Revolution, the second application, November 9, is the seed where it ends. So you got the beginning and the end. Then you have a period of preparation. And what happens in 1775? 1775. That's yeah. the um I think it's revolution to, breaks out between Britain and the States. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to say 1795. 
Um, then I have it because it's supposed to be 1795. So in the French Revolution, let's see, is where then you have a period of preparation and what happens in 17, this is supposed to be 1795, guys. Revolution breaks out between Britain no, and I the States. I think that's right, because they're going yeah. into war. That's right, because the, the actual battle um, concludes 1781. So, um, and I think 1776, I can't remember. I oh, I'm sorry. I yes, I'm it. sorry. I'm like, I got my yeah. the history's merged too. The wrong 1774, then 1775. Yeah. So you're right, and I yeah. just, I know this, but it's like... Yeah. There's a lot of histories, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so 1774, they set up the first representative body of the colonies, known as the First Continental Congress. This is the seed where the American government begins. The French Revolution, the second application, November 9, is the seed where it ends. Then you have a period of preparation. And what happened in 1775? This is the American Revolution. Yeah. Revolution breaks out between Britain and the states, but it's internal. If we use the 245, it doesn't take us to the beginning, but to the middle column where it fills in our picture because it shows the period of preparation and then this revolution. It takes us from 2019 to where the revolution begins in 2020. When we come to this history, we'll want to look at 2020. We did mention this in our earlier classes and we've only got a couple of classes left. So this 2020, um, you got 1774 here, and here's the line where we're bringing in for us here. So we've added this here from the American Revolution. This would be 1775, and it lines up as well with 2520. I don't remember if I have more on this slide. I don't want to fast forward, but maybe we do. Okay. So 1774 lines up with November 9 on our line. Everybody can see that, and along with the French Revolution, the second application as well, and then with the Civil War now adding the American Revolution on here, you see this, the First Continental Congress, then you have this um, preparation here, and then you got this war that's going to ensue, okay? Let's see here. So it takes us from 2019 to where revolution begins in 2020. When we come to this history, we want to look at 2020. We did mention in our first class, okay, so takes us to 2020. You've got, we had November 9, our period of time, 2019, takes us to a period of preparation. It takes us to revolution in 2020. What is the preparation? That's interesting to look at that, to see how- To understand what these preparations yeah, were? Yeah, to know how they're preparing to fight back. I mean, because it'll be interesting to see what they're doing in order to prepare to fight back. Well, we know that in the French Revolution and in the Russian Revolution, you had white terror as well. Whatever white terror amounts to. I know for us right now, it's about education and learning what the what equality is and yes. what's going on. Amen. That's true because as we're being educated, even those in um, the world, you know, like outside the movement, they know the importance of education and being educated on the issues being educated on what's going on and things like that like they know in order to be an important um citizen you know to be able to help the government you have to have the right education to be able to fight for your liberty and justice so externally would that be investigations because they're learning say that again Externally, would their preparation be investigations because it's helping them learn and get the ammo oh, and they need. see the truth of what's really going on. Yeah, right? and then they can use that to fight back. Right, so information is still kind of a, that information warfare. Because that's what they're doing with impeachment right and now is a bunch of investigations. Up as well, with Al Gore, with the election between what year was that? Al Gore and uh, Bush with the election and the recount. And oh the, yeah, the that's, oh that was two thousand four or something like that. No, no, before two thousand four, because um, nineteen, no two thousand or nine. So I have a thought. Yeah, that had to be nineteen ninety nine. Because two thousand one, Bush right. was there with the Twin yeah, Towers. Yeah. So yeah. Al Gore and Bush, I think it was nineteen ninety nine yeah. or ninety eight. Ninety eight and ninety nine, he was president. Yeah. No. I yes. know, it was something like Reagan that. and Bush, because you have Reagan and Bush nineteen ninety nine. First term or a second? It was first term. It was his first term. When that happened? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, was I didn't remember. But that, if you go back to um, prior to everybody's Michael Moore, that video in 9-11, mm -hmm. 
he goes through like really quick that whole Reagan, Bo uh, Al Gore, Bush, yeah. a skerfuffle and scandal in that's Florida really and everything that mind. happened. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember though what what purpose that? I mean, a lot of things. What purpose that served? Is everybody was getting an education in the Constitution? Yeah. 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 So I have I have a thought. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you're saying that our preparation is um, um, all these things that we're learning in the new information that's coming out and stuff like that, correct? Pretty much. Again. So then that that preparation, whichever it is, is gonna cause the white terror because white terror is just like a martial law. If you're gonna have someone come up against the government or fight against, you know, for justice. And we have a dictator um, that could possibly be a reign of terror. Well, whatever it is, yeah. whoever it is, and it seems like it would be the Democrats because it's these ones that we're fighting here, they lose and this go new government is put into place and these ones are going to fight against the new government, no, but there's going to be others that are going to join it. 2000, okay. But he's also going to, the, 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 this, this battle is lost though, and he wins. Because so the, yeah, the, the white terror is the people rising up, but they don't actually win. They fail. Yeah, they fail at it. So Trump will carry on through all that. It's just a revolt, and they get squished. Okay. That time. <laughs> That's weird. You want to come down and get squished with us? <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> oh, question? I didn't hear the answer. I didn't hear the question. Well, your time is coming to get squished up there, too, so... <laughs> And may we all bring glory and honor to God when, when that happens. <laughs> when we're squished. <laughs> you guys will be knocking on my door pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> so using the Civil War here and then the American Revolution, the American <laughs> Revolution is use, being used to um, demonstrate the counter-revolution against this First Continental Congress, correct? So we're discussing the American Revolution now, and we've already done this. We just want to look at it again. The reform line of the 144,000, and we'll fill in the way marks. Where do we start the reform line? 1989, is that what she's referring to? Interaction, yes. Yeah. And if this flows well, we'll do well. So then that's the time of the end, 1989. Where do we go next? 9-11. 9-11. And the next way mark for... Sunday law for the 144,000 is the Sunday law. Oh, yeah, and to close the probation, and the second or harvest. Uh, no, what hmm. harvest is the second of it. Okay, that's right. And there's just one way mark that we want to put in between these one way mark missing, and what would that be? 2009. No, 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 never mind. Sorry, that is actually in between here. Midnight loud cry, but your loud cry. So now the line of the priests, we begin at 1989 with the time of the end because 144,000 covers this whole history. Then we see that this line can be divided into fractals and a group that goes first are the priests. So we see this one big line, the 144,000, we can be made into fractals and we see the line of the priests. Um, you get in there, someone raised up at that time that begins to study the prophecy. Next we go to 2001, and then 2014, and then 2019, and our close of probation. 2019 is our close of probation, and then Panium or the second advent for the priest. So we have 1989 to Panium for the line of the priest. Why won't you just put Panium there instead of second advent? Well, I mean, because, oh, yeah, because she's not putting Rafi either, so I guess that makes, um, yeah, 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 okay. It does get complicated when you, especially when you get into Sunday law as well. <laughs> yeah, law is, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so now we'll lay out the line of the Levites, where, where is their time at the end? So we've got our first slide here that we've already finished, and we're going to do the line of the Levites. <laughs> You did it for us. I did it for you. <laughs> I, I probably got too tired of trying to be tedious. 
So then you have, so the time of the, the Levites, where is their time at the end? It's 9-11, which is their first way mark over here. And then you have Raphia, 2019. What did I miss here? Then you have 2014. Then you have Raphia and Panium is their shut door. And then Sunday Law is their second coming. So you've got 9-11, 2014. You've got Raphia, Panium, their shut door, and their second advent, Sunday Law. That's where I said it confused you because... <laughs> I know. Because their Sunday law is the second advent. Okay, so next we have the Nephinims. Where is their time of the end? So they line up their time of the end is 2014. 2019, Panium, Sunday law, and their closed door. Going through the agricultural model to 2014 to 2019, the plowing for the Nephinims, the early rain, 2019 to Panium, latter rain, Panium to Sunday law, and then harvest Sunday law to close of probation. So that close of probation is um, the final close of probation for everybody. That's this one here, yeah. Yeah. The one on that's, this one. Yeah, I know. Yes. But up there, too, on the line of the yes. 140, that's a close of probation for, yes. for yeah, the final close of probation. Yeah. So harvest for the 144,000 on their line is after close of probation. That's harvest here. Daniel 12 1 before the second advent, but for the Nephinims, their harvest is Sunday law to the close probation. So you've got harvest here for the 144,000. Daniel 12 1, which is before the second advent, this is the harvest of the 144,000. The reason we wanted to review this is what brought us to the history of Pyrus. We went from Acts 27. Sister Susan, what are you referring to? Are you referring to the one, the 144,000 line? Or are you referring to the Nephinim? Because they're both the same. Yeah. So the answer would be yes. She's asking, um, yeah, she's, yeah, both. She's asking, oh, yeah, both. So both is Daniel 12.1. Say that again. That state from the beginning. The close of probation for the Nephinim is the same as the close of probation yes. for the Daniel. I'm yeah, Daniel 12. it's 12, Daniel 12, 1. Yeah, they're the same. So we went from Acts 27 to Pyrus, and what took us there? The number 273. And where do we put 273? What? Huh? 273? Between uh -huh. Panium and Sunday Law. <laughs> you cheated. <laughs> <laughs> Between Panium and Sunday Law, we mark the 273. Everybody remember that? Mm -hmm. That that's how Pirate or Acts 27 got us to Pirate. Yeah, Pirate got us to I get that part, but yeah. And the making up of the Levites, correct? Yeah, because Panium was uh, Egypt sending ambassadors to Rome, and then Sunday was Rome sending ambassadors to Egypt, right? Sister Susan wants you to repeat what you said about the 273 and how that's placed in between. Um, from Acts 27, when you get to Pyrus, the history of Pyrus, the Acts 27 took you to the number 273. 273 took you to Numbers chapter 3, where the making up of the Levites. And marking that on the line, using, um, using the histories to line them up, we saw the 273 comes in after Panium. So it refers to the Levites that are being made up here. She says, thank you. Okay, I hope I did that justice. There's probably something what does it what does it represent or did I miss that? What does what represent? The 273. The Levites. The Levites. It takes you to the history of Pyrus. In Acts 27, 273 took you to the history of Pyrus. And it takes you to what Adriana just said, where it says Egypt sends ambassadors Two, to Rome. 273, I think, was when Tarentum gave up to Italy and the war was over. And then two a little bit after that, Pyrus died. Was it 275? Because Pyrus dies at Sunday Law. Yeah. Yeah. What did you say they yeah. send? They send what to Rome? Ro what did they Egypt send sends Rome? ambassadors to Rome. And then at Sunday Law, Rome sends ambassadors to Egypt. That's right. Okay. So at Panium, we know that Putin receives his wound here, right? Yeah. And this is his destruct his Deadly wound and then his death at Sunday Law, um, which is 272, if I remember right. No, 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 no. Ambassador Egypt sends ambassadors to Rome in 273. Yeah. 
and okay, Egypt is. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, and Sister Adriana, restate all you said about that because you know that was misstated at first. So if you say it again, no, Egypt it sends ambassadors to Rome, and then at Sunday, no, but she said I Sunday, messed it up. Yeah, she messed it up. Oh, so I was saying it was at Panium. It's not. It's at so um, Panium is where Pyrrhus loses the battle in Beneventum. Right. 273, Egypt sends ambassadors to Rome. So 272. Which is a big thing for Rome. Yeah, they were welcomed on the world stage of, of right. politics. And then 272, Pyrrhus dies, right. and Rome sends ambassadors to Egypt, and Tarentum falls. So are we looking at, uh, are we looking at Egypt and Rome as king of the south, king of the north? Are we looking at Egypt and Rome as the world versus? You know, Egypt was representing, I think, the UN, so the world and Greece. Yeah. That's something that I've always, that's always, I've battled with, and I know I've talked with a few of you about it, that I struggle with what that means. But actually, because I think it was you, Jonathan, that was. That yeah, I, we were talking about it for a while. That um, if Egypt sends ambassadors to Rome, if, if, if Panium at the death, or at the wound, or whatever you want, it, of Pyrrhus, that. Rome comes on the scene of world affairs because of this. So what you were saying to me, that would be the United States. The United States, because the United States is getting ready to rise and be over the UN, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I finally maybe get that. I don't know if anybody else got what I just Where, said. What were you thinking, though, before? I'm always looking at somehow Rome and the papacy coming back in. I, I, I am too, and I think that the papacy does come back in at around the close of probation or maybe a little bit before, like the big one. Can I make a suggestion that helped me a lot? I've been listening <laughs> to the September um, videos in, Re in Reunion France, the one that they did right after the Bible conference in Germany, and he makes it really clear that the Europe power of that papacy is dead. It's dead. The Europe power, yeah. That's because Europe was their power, right? That was their country, but now America is No, 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 you're not, just let me, let me finish this. The papacy, that beast of Europe, the, the first beast of Daniel, of Revelation 13, is completely dead. When it resurrects, it doesn't resurrect as that beast again. The only way it gets life again is through the image or the copy that the United States makes. That's, and the copy isn't the original. It's just a copy of it. it looks that's what I'm saying. So Rome, the, Europe was the power of Rome, or, or the, uh, ro sorry, Rome was the power of the papacy. That's no longer going to be the case because the United States would be the power of the papacy. No. That's, isn't it? No, that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is we're looking at the papacy coming in as a king of the north, I feel like, and I don't think they're going to come in ever as a king of the north again. The United States in 1989 became the king of the north, and it's going to continue to be the king of the north. It's so not it going to stop. Life. I agree with that, though. So it gives life to that same spirit. There's yeah. the, the problem that I had with that was, and I don't know that I have a problem with what you said, um, but in regards to the papacy re returning in spiritual gifts and first spiritual gifts, you do still have the papacy with a literal Sunday law and it happens at the close of probation. So do you know what, you know what I'm saying? Like where we use spiritual gifts to say there's no Sunday law. There's no, in, when you read it, there's no Sunday law at the literal Sunday law waymark in that book. Cause it's, it had to do with slavery. But if you, if you re read where it does talk about the Sunday law, it still talks about one at the close of probation, and it's in regards to the papacy. So if we have all these writings from both Great Controversy and Spiritual Gifts pointing to a papacy at the close of probation, then doesn't that mean there has to be? Well, I Wait, thought the United States... But I'll also say that uh, modern Rome has to conquer three geographical areas in order to room the world mm -hmm. supremely. Modern Rome. Like, just like pagan Rome and papal Rome had to conquer three geographical areas, that is modern Rome. So when it conquers that third geographical area, it rules supremely. Modern Babylon, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Well, oh, go ahead. So that's what I'm, all I'm trying to say is the, the way that the papacy comes in at the Sunday law isn't going to be as the overruling power. It's going to be as one piece of the puzzle, but the king of the north power is the United States. So when we're looking back at the line of Pyrrhus, 
and we're looking at applications of King of the North versus King of the South, the King of the North has to be represented by the U.S., not the papacy. I, I, and I, I, I do agree with that. That's yeah. not, I think what I'm speaking is after that, for one thing, like at the close of probation, not at the Sunday law, because the Sunday law, I agree with everything that you're saying. I don't know what form the papacy has to come in, but it has to come in some form because they're the one that are, it still says that they're the one that's going to institute the Sunday law. It says it in first spiritual gifts. At close of probation on the big line, there's nothing that happened besides the antichrist, but the Idoki war number three says the papacy does come back in at Sunday law. It's just not the king of the north. It's close of probation if you read in first spiritual gifts. Look at look in spir first spiritual gifts and look for Sunday law. Or no, sorry, look for um doesn't say Sunday law, it says uh for, uh if you look up first day, it'll come up with the, the paragraph. Under what there. chapter? Do you know the chapter it's under? I don't, but I can hear I'll find it really quickly. Okay. Can I say something? Well, yep. don't we know that the United States is the daughter? So aren't they isn't the papacy with um what am i trying to say isn't the united states the daughter so therefore they have roots of papacy of the papacy yeah and, the, and this is the work of the daughter the mother right. had her turn and the daughter the daughter brings the head of john the baptist to the mother yeah. whoa who's um, wouldn't it be like um the spiritual papacy instead of the literal papacy wouldn't it be we, we we'd be looking at the spiritual aspect which would be that spiritual power that encompasses church and state yeah i was i was gonna say that because what parmender was saying in those reunion videos he said that image of daniel 2 what that says is babylon is going to be alive in the feet but in a, in a spiritual sense it's the same way like you have a grandfather a father and a son the grandfather dies but his physical traits and sometimes his personality the way he yeah. talks that is left in the son and then in his grandson too it's like that that uh, genetics is kind of left through every single kingdom that follows that same spirit is left through to the end so when nebuchadnezzar made the whole statue of gold he wasn't totally wrong you, but he was being, yeah, so that was, um, no, 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 that's wrong. That was the, the thing, but we do know in some form, I think my mom was watching the French Guyana videos and he was going over, um, with Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel showing the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. And I think the papacy does have a part to play in there, but it's not like the big overwhelming role. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think I agree with that. Yeah. I, I think I might have been, I'm looking at the passage here too, and it wasn't actually talking about the papacy, it was, it was the other focus that I was looking at was the Sunday law, because there is a Sunday law in, in First Spiritual Gifts. What um, chapter? At the death decree. It's, oh. It's uh, chapter 36, time of, the time of Jacob's trouble. And so it's talking about where the saints, it says, uh, I saw writing and copies of it scattered in different parts of the land, giving orders that unless the saints should yield their peculiar faith, give up the Sabbath and observe the first day, they were at liberty after such a time to put them to death. Um, and this is from the book that we were saying there was no Sunday law. And there is, but it's, it's not that we were wrong. It's that it was pointing to a Sunday law that's happening at the close of probation during the time of trouble. You know what I mean? Uh that overlapped with uh, great controversy history, though, because her, if you apply that, I think their close of probation was 18, was it 1863? Was that the second advent already? 1863 was then the second advent. Was their second advent. Yeah, so they were gearing up before that to pass, um, to get church and state together based off of what A.T. Jones was showing in 1863. But so, either way, they still had... Ellen White was predicting a Sunday law. It was just going to come at a different time period. It was still being predicted in that. Yeah. I mean, this is long before the controversy was written. Anyway, it's, I think it's a kind of a, too much of a sidetrack. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> okay. So we'll move forward. And we're actually going to not finish this because there's like 30 something slides here and we're only on number 17. Ooh. So we'll either you get a nice relaxing week. <laughs> yeah, we do that or we go on parables. No, no, yeah, no, no, you can finish. We do it either way. Everybody yeah, decides. Finish. It doesn't matter to me. I can do it next week. No, you can finish. It's, um, it's totally up to everybody else. Yeah, go ahead and finish. We can decide after because you're already ready. So um, let's go to 
it doesn't matter to me if we wait till next week. Depends on everybody else and how they feel about the momentum and whether or not we'll forget stuff. If we went back to the line of the priests and overlaid Millerite history, what way mark are we missing? We're missing August 1st. Where do we put that on the line of the priests? Where do we put August 1st on the line of the priests? I can't cover and hide it from you guys. See that, I know. I was <laughs> that, but I was trying. 2016. Yeah, trying. So we put August 1. We remember we've got Boston, Concord, and Exeter, right? Yeah. August 1st is what camp meeting? <clears throat> oh, Concord? Concord. And Concord is what? No, it's Boston. No, no. Concord, right? Concord, Boston, Exeter. Boston, Concord, it, it is Boston. <laughs> Boston is yeah, 2014. Oh, okay. Boston so, is 2014. Okay. It's an alphabetical order. I know. <laughs> I know. That's what I was like. I knew that Boston went first. So, so August 1st okay. is 2016, and we call that Concord. We see Boston. We call that Concord here. We see Boston, Concord, and Exeter. So we have here 2014 to 2018, 2016 is Concord. We have Boston, Concord, and Exeter. So now we have a way mark between 2014 and 2018. We've already discussed at camp meeting um, that they come down and impact the line of the Nephilim. So Boston, Concord, and Exeter are gonna have um, an impact down here on the line of the Nephilims. What are they for the Nephilims? 2016 and 2018, if you were to carry it straight down. 2016 to 2018, but the on the reform line, what would they be, what would they name them? The increase of knowledge. This is for the Nephilim, Boston, and Concord and Exeter on our line come down here for the Nephilims, and they become an increase of knowledge and a formalization of the message. So we can see that for the Nephilims or the world, there's been an increase of knowledge and a formalization, just like we had from 1989 to 9/11. Okay, I have a question. So what is their, in now it makes me think as far as the application, because what is their increase of knowledge? Because they're fighting, they're going to be fighting for, they're fighting for true liberty, okay? Freedom, right? So what, oh, okay, yeah, I get it, never mind. It's the same thing that we're actually, it's the same test that we're actually, um, isn't it the same? There's because based they're on seeing the external events. Exactly, but they're seeing those things. They're seeing right. conspiracy theories, they're seeing racism right. and sexism at that time, too. Right. All throughout there. So they're seeing all the external as well. Yeah. So we can see that for the Nephilims and for the world, there's an increase of knowledge and a formalization, just like we had from 1989 to 911. An increase of knowledge and a formalization. Now we can identify two way marks in these histories. For the Levites, 9-11 to 2014, we have two way marks. What was the first one is still under discussion. So here in the Levites, she says still under discussion. And the second one is 2012, which was the prediction of 2014 and that there would be a Sunday law. I think that what's discussed here is also the 2520 series that, um, and then also 2004 is discussed as well. Um, then we have these waymarks, Boston, Concord, and Exeter, and they have to impact the Levites and the Nephilims. So wait, the Levites are, Le wait, what did you just say about the 2012? Because you're putting that on the, that's for, what is that? For 2012? For the illegal. Oh, for the external? Because it would have had to be. Yeah, yeah. Because they're not knowing what we yeah, know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Thank you. I'm mixing things up again. Oh, it's okay. I was like, is yeah. this the last slide? So 2012, huh? Is this the last slide? No. I know, but I mean, for. Oh, we can stop right here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We can stop right here. So 2012, if, if somebody correct me if I'm wrong, when it comes to externally, um, we have a message that comes from Great Britain, correct? And that was part to do with Alexander Nix and going on into Cambridge Analytica. Oh, yeah. Okay. Correct? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to pause here. And then I'm going to ask you guys, we can go on to, because uh, Sister Victoria has put together a great parable study. We can continue this one next Sabbath or do the parable study. Um, you guys pick what you want to do for the afternoon. We either finish this study or go on to parables because I know she's got a good study on parables and we can pick this up next week.
I'm fine if we continue with, um, yeah, if we finish. I, well, we all have a I choice. Think... I'm putting my parable in. I choose the parable. Parables. I think Sister Victoria didn't want that. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, Sister Susan did say finish. Oh, ja Sister Jackie says finish. So, um, Ooh, Cassie. Finish. <laughs> we say finish here. Okay. Okay. So, okay. That was the Urim. He just cast it. It's all, <laughs> all right. We're okay, we'll finish and she'll have a study ready for well, you know it's just one last thing next week. We're ready. Yeah. Okay. I like her idea. Who's yours? What was my I have a week off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. Because I I mean it's easier probably to finish it while we're in the flow yeah. of it. Anyways. Yeah. So this is a this is a good review. Good. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Then uh so that was slide number 18, if anybody helped me remember. And we'll jump back into that slide. So maybe we can ask Brother Victor to close out in prayer and pray for the blessing on the food. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again for uh, being with us this Sabbath and uh, giving us these uh, uh, lessons and studies. We thank you for uh, all the effort that's been put in these studies, and we ask that as we uh, move forward that you would continue to bless us and uh, guide us and uh, finish the work that you've begun in us. We thank you for uh, counting us worthy to be amongst those who are learning and understanding these things. We ask that you would um, uh, bless this uh, the food that we're about to eat and bless the hands that prepared it and continue to bless us this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you.